Hello, and welcome to the background lecture for lab assignment number four. The lecture material for this lab assignment is predominantly in lectures 11 through 13. Related educational materials are in sections 1.7 through 1.8.1. Primary goals for this lab assignment are as follows. In parts one and two, we will be looking at non-ideal voltmeters and non-ideal power sources. Both of these parts will give us additional practice in dealing with parallel and series resistances. For the non-ideal voltmeters part, we'll see that measuring a voltage changes the voltage being measured. Now hopefully the change to the voltage we're measuring is negligible, but we'll look at a condition where that change is not negligible. Likewise, for non-ideal power sources, we said in lecture that a power source can supply only limited power. We will also wire up a circuit which attempts to pull more power from the power source than it is actually capable of delivering, and we'll look at the side effects of that. In part three, we'll wire up a simple operational amplifier circuit, the inverting voltage amplifier we saw in lecture already. And finally, we'll take a look at a Thevenin's theorem example in which we try to obtain maximum power transfer to a load. In this particular case, we're going to look at a limitation to the maximum power transfer theorem. Now, typically, we know that if we have some Thevenin circuit, if we apply a load to that circuit, we want to set the load resistance equal to the Thevenin resistance for the circuit in order to deliver maximum power to the load. This theorem does not work in reverse. If we have a fixed load, in general, you cannot change the Thevenin resistance in order to deliver more power to the load. We'll examine that in part four of this lab assignment. In part one of lab assignment four, we're going to analyze a non-ideal voltmeter. Now, ideally, a voltmeter acts like an open circuit. It does not pull any current from the circuit that it is applied to. However, any real voltmeter has a finite resistance. Typically, that internal resistance of the meter is very high. And specifically, you want that resistance to be high compared to the resistances in the circuit that you're measuring. What we're going to do is look at the circuit to the right of this slide. We're going to apply 8 volts to a series combination of two 10 mega ohm resistors. Now, 10 mega ohms is not negligible compared to the internal resistance of most voltmeters. So when we hook up our voltmeter to the one 10 mega ohm resistor, we'll notice that the voltage being measured by that voltmeter is not half of 8 volts. It will not be 4 volts because we're drawing a significant amount of current into the voltmeter itself. We have a parallel combination of the meter resistance and the 10 mega ohm resistance. So we'll see a significant change in the voltage being measured beyond what we would expect from a theoretical examination of the circuit. Now let's analyze this circuit to determine the effects that the meter resistance will have on the measurement that's being made. The circuit we're going to be wiring up consists of two 10 mega ohm resistors in series. So we have some applied voltage. I'm going to call it Vn. It's actually 8 volts. And we have a 10 mega ohm resistor in series with a 10 mega ohm resistor. And we want to find V out. Now, ideally, any meter I connect up to V out acts as an open circuit. Therefore, V out is going to be one half of V in by our voltage divider formula. In reality, however, when I connect up a meter to this, I have some meter resistance R sub m. That means that the current through the meter, I sub m, is not necessarily exactly zero. Drawing some current from this changes V out. So non-ideally, V out is going to be less than 1 half of Vn, since this parallel combination of R sub m and this 10 mega ohm resistor will be a lower resistance than this 10 mega ohm resistor up here. Now, depending on what Rm is, this may be significantly less than 1 half of Vn. Let's take a look at our meter and see how it behaves under these circumstances. Here's the circuit as wired. We have two 10 mega ohm resistors. 
I'm applying VP plus to one end of the series combination, I have grounded the other end. If we look at the waveform software, we'll see that I am currently applying 8 volts across the resistive combination. Now let me connect up V meter 1 to the intermediate voltage, the voltage across one of the resistors. So this voltage measurement is going to give me the voltage between this node and this node. At the moment, I've got about 700 millivolts, so about 7 tenths of a volt across that resistor. The meter resistance for these V meters is fairly low. And in fact, if you leave that as an unknown in your analysis, you can calculate an estimate of the meter resistance by having this meter resistance in parallel with this 10 mega ohm resistor such that that meter resistance will give you 7 tenths of a volt. Now, different meters will tend to have different internal resistances. If I disconnect this and use my handheld DMM to measure the voltage, so I'm going to measure the voltage across the same pair of nodes, actually getting about 2.7 volts with this particular voltmeter. So this voltmeter, it's still not giving me the 4 volts that it should give me if this were a true open circuit, but it's giving me something closer to the actual voltage than my V meter 1. This meter has a higher internal resistance than V meter 1 does. In part 2 of lab assignment 4, we'll analyze a non-ideal power supply. Now we mentioned in lecture that non-ideal power supplies have an internal resistance indicated as R sub S on this slide. Now this internal resistance keeps us from allowing the power supply to provide infinite power to any circuit connected to it. That works out just fine as long as any resistance that you connect to the power supply does not draw more power from the circuit than the source can deliver. So what we will do is place a very small resistance across our power supply and take a look at the effects of that small resistance on the power delivered to the load. Okay, and we'll notice that as the load resistance gets to be on the order of the internal resistance of the power supply, we start seeing some significant changes from the power supply's ideal behavior. Now let's analyze this circuit to determine what kind of effect a relatively small load resistance has on the power that can be delivered by the supply. Okay, our non-ideal source is going to look like an ideal voltage source V sub S in series with some internal resistance R sub S. Now for my demonstration, I'm going to hook this up to an overall resistance of 2.5 ohms. And I'm going to set V sub S equal to 1 volt. For an ideal source, R sub S is 0. We have no internal resistance. Therefore, I sub S should be 1 over 2.5 or about 0 0.4 amps. If R sub S is not 0, if it is a positive number, this source current will go down and we will deliver less power to the load than we are expecting. Now let's demonstrate the circuit and see what kind of power delivery we are going to be getting out of this. This is the circuit that I've created. I have four 10 ohm resistors in parallel. That will give me a total resistance between this node and this node of 2.5 ohms. I'm using VP plus to apply power to this parallel combination, I have grounded this node here. I'm using my DMM as an ammeter, so it is in line with VP plus. VP plus sends current into my DMM. The DMM then passes it on to this node here. Going to the waveform software, if I apply power to this, so VP plus is set to 1 volt, I will turn that on. I'm getting a current of about 0.36 amps going through this parallel resistance combination. From my analysis, I was expecting 4 tenths.